Could you do it 15 minutes ago? Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, funny story. We had such a charming opening. Funny story. We have been doing the workshop for the past 15 minutes. This might be the first week we were actually on time. and <laughs> We started right on time. We've been doing the thing for a full 15 minutes, thinking we were streaming. So, I really hope we are now. Yeah, no, we definitely are. It says live up there. It's because usually I use YouTube's old system for doing it, mm -hmm. and I'm, now I tried the new one. Mm -hmm. um, Love that. Love that for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wow. How do you feel about reliving the last 15 minutes? So if you tell, you I'm can. so excited. It was rehearsal. It was rehearsal. And you know what? Nobody got to hear the gigantic uh, freaking oopsie that I, that I said. So we, we can ignore that. Oh my gosh. All right. Hi, everybody. Wow. Thank you uh, for staying with us, if you have been. Through our great bout of apparent silence. Amazing. Um, I'm hearing now that the audio is way out of sync. Way out of sync. Maybe it, maybe it depends. Maybe it's not for everybody. Okay. Well, I hope it's working. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, this week our basic focus is going to be, uh, y'all are in the middle of, <laughs> you're going to chill out. <laughs> no, it's so silly. <laughs> this week our basic focus is, so y'all are in the middle of writing a draft. Some of you actually finished your drafts, which is nuts. Uh, I think I write pretty fast and that's really, really fast. And we got so many submissions. That is so, so exciting. Yeah. I don't mind gloating about that a second time. Uh, this is like the feeling in teaching that like, I think... Uh, all of your your teachers like hound for right people being super invested in what they're doing uh and it's so great to see you all actually writing so thank you you made my week my month um my uh, quarantine that's fine uh, <laughs> but no like when we got so many submissions this week and it was really really cool to see that everybody has actually been writing because that's what we're all here for right yeah absolutely um, so, love that. Uh, now, I have closed the link that I was working from before because, you know, I already read it. So, um, so before we begin, um, I just want to talk about the organization that we're going to be supporting this week. Um, if you've been with us this whole time, you'll know that every week uh, we try to direct people to a different fundraiser or charity or something like that so that if you have been enjoying these streams and you want to support us, um, this is where you can give money. Mm -hmm. So this week we are supporting the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund, which is, it's a GoFundMe um, started by Shade Literary Arts. And um, they are raising money to help at least 100 queer writers of color who have been financially impacted by the current COVID-19 Priority will be given to queer trans women of color and queer disabled writers of color, but they hope that this relief fund will help as many queer writers of color as it can. So um, we've left the link in the description box below, so please do check that out uh, if you have anything to give. Uh, they have a pretty long way to go to meet their goal. They're at almost 20000 They're hoping to raise $100,000. Um, and we think this would be a really great cause to support, so if, we, if you can, I hope you'll check it out. Yeah, the link is in the description. It would be awesome to see, you know, from from us repping this some like some real progress in there. So if you yeah. have the money, uh, I would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank so you. So think about it if you can. Um, okay. So, oh my gosh, I'm just like deja vu. Yeah, it's just guys, this is so weird because we <laughs> already did all of this. No, it's cool. I mean, what we had gotten through, uh, which we're about to do again. Uh, is uh, this week we want to share uh, a few more submissions from the submit channel because there were so many and because I think that at this point in the writing process where you all are just drafting um, really one of the most important things that we can do is be there as as coaches slash cheerleaders right um, so we want to we want to root you on because this part of the process is lonely and it can be boring and uh, but you're doing the right thing. Yeah, so we just want to like give more shout outs to people who are doing a great job because mm -hmm. everybody is doing a great job and I wish that we could read all of them. But we're going to do three today. Mm -hmm. So um, just as we already did, I will, do, I will do one, Kevin will do one, I'll do another one. All right, sounds great. So this submission is from Ace and it's pretty short, so I will read the whole thing. In a crumpled bungalow lit against Chicago's ragged skyline, I've spent each passing night of the last three years awake. Don't ask me why. I've talked myself hoarse to every sleep specialist in the book, a dozen psychiatrists, even a couple of cops back when I thought they would believe me. Most of them think I'm a liar. A couple ones, the nice ones, just think I'm nuts. 
And hey, I haven't ruled out the possibility. Because here's the honest to God truth. One night, three years ago, I met a man at the docks who told me things I can't remember yet can't forget, and I haven't slept a second since. At first, it was just weird. I've had insomnia before. This wasn't so far out of the ordinary. But then days passed, weeks. I was exhausted all the time. Sunlight felt like someone was x-raying my retinas. I remember looking up the longest recorded time a person had gone without sleep and realizing I'd almost doubled that. And yet, I wasn't in the hospital. I hadn't collapsed or started seeing things or anything else that would point towards a physical or mental collapse. So when the doctors stopped looking for answers, I stopped asking questions. I quit my job and then got three more. I figured, hey, if there's no getting around it, I'm not going to be the kind of person who lies around in bed all day thinking about what if. Besides, I had rent to pay, and Chicago doesn't exactly come cheap. I dropped out of school, though. No point trying to study when words stop looking like words and more like a failed Rorschach, or when you can't listen to any lecture that presses past 20 minutes. So, here I am, three years later, and not gonna lie, I'm falling apart more than a little bit. I'm so tired that whenever I have a free moment, I lie on the ground and close my eyes, trying to remember what sleep felt like. Most days, I just want to sink into the earth and melt into nothingness. No luck yet. I almost overdosed on sleeping pills about a month in, trying to get myself to pass out. But all they did was make my vision blurry and the back of my throat taste like copper. I've also tried standing on my head, got a three-day headache, eating a stupid amount of calories and then lying out in the sun, more sick than sleepy, and having my best friend read aloud from her physics textbook. Just two hours of pure, uninterrupted misery. At this point, my ideas are getting further out there, and I know it. I jumped out of a plane last year. I tried an isolation chamber a few weeks ago, which is the closest I've gotten, I think. This weekend, I've got a different idea, and its name is Lake Michigan. That still slaps. Yeah. Second time through, that's still really, really it's good. It's really good. Mm-hmm. And frustrating, because it's all we get. Just yeah. these three paragraphs. No, I mean, the, the especially the first time that you that you read it through, yeah. the um, the end just, like, hit me in the stomach with how badly I wanted to know what was going to happen. Yeah, but it's such a good hook. It's excellent the whole way through. And it's very good at, like, pitching itself at the beginning. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, we get this mystery that's kind of hanging there, right? Who is the man at the docks and what did he say? Yeah. And we, we don't get to know. Like, for some reason, the narrator doesn't tell mm-hmm. us anything about that mm-hmm. but we presume we'll find out more about it later um and we have a direction we know we're going to like michigan we don't know why and i really like the character voice it's very strong mm-hmm. um it's fantastic i love it excellent yeah great job Ace. awesome i'm excited to read more um if you keep on going with it Ace, thank you uh the the submission that i picked this week um is by remus it's called cufflinks and canaries um, it's about four pages long, so I'm, so far, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but I do want to read the first like page and a half or so, the first like 500 words. Um, so, cufflinks and canaries. The roof tiles creak beneath Alder's feet. With shadow-tipped fingers, he swings from rafter to balustrade, feet aching as they meet harsh marble. Through billowing drapes, the voices of strangers in tinkling glass echo. Ears pricked, Alder creeps forward. Upon first glance, the room appears empty, yet still he waits, listening to displaced air. Something is wrong. Within a dangling birdcage, twin canaries twitter. Alder smirks to himself. With casual ease, he plucks his way through the displayed valuables, pocketing discarded cufflinks and rifling through hidden drawers for the easily misplaced. From the gardens below, music drifts, laughter trailing like a younger sibling upon its coattails. The clock strikes 12 witching hour the allotted time of his heist is up and yet restraint softening alder allows himself a moment more with eager eyes he appraises the portraits the largest contains three phantasmal dogs haunting a sunflower crowned child within the smallest a tree curls forward into a river flood waters rising high upon its trunk the last depicts a broken wall thousands of eyes peering through the broken mortar Judging by their size, all could distinguish, or dis- this is the second time I made that mistake, all could disguise a lockbox. Thoughts tipping toward frenzied, he darts to the nearest. 
phantasmal dogs. Shadows trickling, Alder probes the frame. It refuses to lift outward, therefore the mechanism must be connected to the canvas itself. As the voices rise, music clattering to an abrupt end, Alder shifts his focus onto the painting. Stubbornly counting each second, he taps his way across the frozen surface, sweeping through furrows and crests with shivering ease. If his mentor could see him now. He shuts the thought away, allowing the corners of his mind to blanket with the creaking of the eaves above in a swish of drapes and the scent of approaching rain. A candle flares against the darkness. He whirls, shadow darting into the nearest available cranny, and Alder would do the same except the coal smudged eyes of an aristocrat are fixed upon him dark as a curse mark. Stealing in the night, how original. Better than evening parties, Alder snaps, blood rushing to his ears as he inches toward the window. I hear those tend to drag onward until the rooster crows. Uh, it appears you have been the victim of some well-meant gossip. The aristocrat neatly blocks his path, candle flickering wide. My household does not affiliate itself with roosters. Alder scoffs, this is all going wrong. And why is that? The aristocrat dances closer, waistcoat shimmering bold as the tail of a sea serpent. Perhaps roosters seem awfully dull watch creatures when instead a shadow thief could be acquired. Alder flinches. What makes you think a thief so supposedly accomplished would be willing to play watchdog, he snarls. Perhaps, the aristocrat whispers, eyes daring to hold his gaze. I would enjoy the challenge. Stolen cufflinks hang heavy in Alder's pocket. The aristocrat offers a hand. There is no need for trepidation. Refusal unspoken on his tongue, Alder slips away. The window is painfully near, silk billowing in welcome. Within moments, he has vaulted the ledge and stands perched upon the balustrade, mimicking a craggy gargoyle from the ruinous cathedrals of old. The aristocrat's voice rips through the silence, a shard of glass against the evening tranquility. A trial, he offers. Seven days. And if I refuse to remain, I will not keep you. Alder looks over his shoulder. He wants to leave, and yet... Surrounded by marble, the aristocrat is a fish among glaciers, pride tipping his chin toward the cloudless sky. That's where I'm going to end that. Um, that that's so good. The descriptions are really, really good. Beautiful. Um, this, so this, I mean, from a language standpoint, one of the things that I love about this is that we're in a very like opulent, decadent setting, and the language is also really opulent and decadent, right? The um, things, you know, things uh, drip. The aristocrat dances across the room, right? Everything is, uh, like, is almost over the top in the way that mm -hmm. it is, uh, is descriptive, right? And it's a choice. I mean, because your language doesn't have to match no, your no, setting at not. all. And this person has chosen to, and it's working really well. Absolutely. It, did, it gives this thing a very, very strong aesthetic. Yes. And a very strong identity, which I like. I like the aesthetic. Yeah, and a great pitch with the um, with the a trial seven days. Yes, we get a setup. Yeah, it just it sets it up. Audience knows what they're in for. Mm -hmm. You tell me seven days, and I'm 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 interested in what a big important thing could possibly happen in the week. Yeah, it feels. This is by no means like, not in any way. When you write, you always need to be like, and here's the time frame. Right. But when you do it, mm -hmm. it's very cool. Um, yeah. Because like it gives us a sense of how much time we're going to cover, what we have to look forward to, mm -hmm. and it gives us a sense of anticipation. Yeah, It feels absolutely. good. It's a, it's a very good technique. Really nice job, Remus. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, love it. Um, okay, so we'll do one more. And if I'm not mistaken, now we are at the point where we were before we restarted last time. Right. All right, new territory. <laughs> so this one, Kevin hasn't actually heard. I haven't heard. heard. Before. <laughs> so... Um, this, I also, I'm just going to say it again, because they haven't heard it. Uh, I was so charmed because this is by Ray, and Ray has, like, formatted it like a school assignment, which I just think is so cute. Um, and it has, like, you know, the course name, and <laughs> our names, and the dates, and it makes me feel like a real teacher, <laughs> which I'm not. <laughs> I have no credentials. Uh, the title of this piece is Rights. That's R-I-T-E-S. Her name is Hollis. Hollis, Hollis, Hollis. Her name is Hollis and her name is magic. Say it. Say it and maybe you'll hear it. Hollis, Hollis, Hollis. Her mother is Sylvia and her older sister is Vivian and her name is Hollis and her little brother is Rosencraft. She picked out her brother's name, and it's even better than hers. 
Her parents call him Ro, but she and Vivi know he's really rosy. Their names are magic. Her dad's is not. Hollis feels like magic. It sounds like a crackling fire. It tastes like honey. But none of that matters when your last name is fucking Mills. She's Hollis Mills, and it's absolute bullshit. This is what everyone knows. There is magic in the world. There are witches and warlocks, and they can do the things you fantasize of and the things that haunt your nightmares. You can tell from the sound of the names. They give names, and the magic goes with it. When witches and warlocks pick new names for themselves, the magic changes, but it's still there. They can hide it, though. It's part of their magic. Every little girl with an unusual name dreams of secretly having magic. Hollis doesn't even need to dream of it. She is a witch. Or, well, she could be. Her mother was a witch, but she gave it all away to be with Dad. Witches and warlocks can be with regular people, and they don't have to give up, give up their magic, but Dad wanted normality, and her mom didn't love magic the way she should have. Hollis does. Vivian and Rosie don't care too much about magic. They both think that there's nothing wrong with just having it and having enough control to keep from doing something stupid. Hollis doesn't really think there's anything wrong with that, even if she doesn't get it. She doesn't hate her mom for not sticking with magic or her dad for not letting magic be a part of their lives. But it's magic. It might be a gross, sticky feeling under her skin that never stops and makes her head dizzy and is only better when she's doing something athletic or sports like swimming or soccer, though that's still not enough for her. Vivi and Rosie say it's because her sports are too warm. They both like the ice. Vivian told her once, when she was littler, that the cold almost feels like it freezes out her magic. That scared her off the ice. Magic isn't always pleasant, but lots of things aren't pleasant. Magic is power and daydreams and everything that all the other stupid kids in her class aren't. And she isn't better than anyone else because she has magic. She knows that. Hollis just knows that she can be more of her, more Hollis, with her magic doing everything it can. And that's why she finally gives in two weeks before her 17th and raids her parents' bedroom. Her mom is at one of Vivian's hockey games, and her dad just left to drive Rosie to figure skating. She has Max an hour. Hollis stares at her parents' blue bedroom and winces. She feels something shift in the air when she steps through the doorway, though she doubts her mom does. Her mom sheds magic and does her best to ignore what she has left. Hollis is going to learn to pick it up one day. She knows it must be possible. Hollis tries to stay away from the bed. That just feels weird. Her magic doesn't feel sticky about it. It just feels itchy. She tries the bedside tables, the wardrobe, the desk, the bookshelf, the closet, the drawers, and when she doesn't find anything, she checks again. And there it is. A silver box. One of those gift boxes that you give to make your presents look cooler than they would in a bag, and easier to deal with than wrapping. It sits in the bottom of the wardrobe, and it doesn't do anything special. It doesn't glow at the edges, there's no taste of grit on her tongue, and she doesn't hear bells. So there's something wrong with it. Hollis's magic always has a sense for everything. This is a box to hide something. I'm gonna stop there. Oh, uh, you're mean. <laughs> you're so mean. Oh, but it looks like there's a lot more. There's a lot more. There's oh. like a ton more. This is six pages. I only read about page and a half. That's awesome. Okay, I'm I'm gonna have to go in and read that. It's so good. It is really good. <laughs> it has a really strong voice. It has a really strong voice. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a choice to write in the present tense, I think. I feel like mm -hmm. default is to write in the past tense. Mm -hmm. um, so present tense is a choice. I think it's working really well here. There's a lot, like there's a sense of tension. Mm -hmm. Um, and something that I really, really like is we're getting details about magic without it feeling like exposition. Without it feeling like a lecture, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, like, right near the end of what I read, like, um, in the context of this box, we're finding out what magic often feels like, right? It can mm -hmm. feel like it's glowing at the edges, a taste of grit on the tongue, hearing bells, um, and it's not the narrator just sitting and telling us those things. It's right. just weaving that into the context of what's happening in the scene. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we learn we learn details of the world when they're relevant, mm -hmm. right? That way that we're already engaged in them. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Star Wars has set us all up to for, like, a terrible relationship 
with exposition because that opening text crawl is really, really famous. <laughs> and also, like, what is it? It's s- cheating. <laughs> it's cheating. And what does it even say? Like, you don't need to read it for the story to no, make sense. No, you really don't. Um, so it's like, it's a really impressive visual. Yeah, but like, story wise, could just cut it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we would figure it out. There are Star Wars super fans out there that are sharpening their pitchforks as we speak. But Come for us. No, don't. Stay home. True. Stay home. <laughs> really awesome submissions in general. These were so, so fun to look through. I'm so proud of everyone. Yeah, for real. Great work. This is great. You're great doing work. the hard thing. Yeah. I'm really proud of these people that we read their stuff, but not just theirs. I mean, everyone's. We read through a bunch. Yeah, we read through a lot. Yeah. And stuff is looking really good. It really is. So thank you all so much. Um, with that, should we get to our business? Let's get to business. All right. So this week, let me transition. All right. Your question's answered. We're doing a grab bag week. We're probably going to do a couple of these uh, throughout the tenure of writing fiction across the void. Um, Because a lot of the topics that people are requesting are really, really good questions, um, but they're not something that we could spend an entire, like, lesson on, an entire hour on. So we just wanted to, like, cover them, but quicker. Yeah. So I tried to focus here on things that might have gotten you stuck while you're drafting your draft. Um, So let's let's go through. You ready, Sebi? Let's do it. Uh, first off, how do you balance action, description, and dialogue? How do you know if you're doing too much of one, too much of another, stuff like that? Um, do you have any gut feelings about this? It's, it's well, I mean, that depends a lot on your format. Yes, usually. Right? Uh, for example, if you're writing an audio drama or a play, it's going to be pretty much all dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, and the transition from one to another is not always going to be smooth. I know right. that after I had been writing audio drama for a long time, when I went back to writing, like, you know, novel-style fiction, yeah. um, my descriptions were nowhere. They were, they I just kind of let them wither on the vine, right? And I needed to relearn how to do that. Um, well, you got some good advice, right? Yeah, I got some that? very good advice. Yeah. Um, so, I, probably the first tip I'd give is, like, open up some of your favorite books and, like, literally just look at the page. Uh, very often you can tell from the physical composition of the page how much people are speaking how much they're uh, doing things, and so on. Um, One concept that I think is useful for us to cover, because they're terms that we use a lot, are scene and exposition. Um, So these are like two real building blocks of uh, of fiction or or nonfiction, or just any time you're telling a story. Um, Scene describes things that happened once. It gives the play-by-play. It's generally, there are of course exceptions, but it's generally more engaging, but it's also much slower. Because you're giving the play-by-play, you need to describe each moment as it occurs. Um, Most stories should be heavily weighted towards scene. As it's a general rule, you want more scene than exposition. um, Because scene is a little bit more exciting and a little bit more gripping because it gives you more room for detail. Um, Exposition is description of a long period of time or generally the way things are. It summarizes. It's generally less engaging, but it can give vicious information more quickly. And it's a vicious temptress. Uh, Did you say vicious information? What did I say? <laughs> yeah, you said it can give vicious information. It can give vicious information. <laughs> I'm a little sleepy today. It's okay. We streamed last night, too. We did. Um, uh, it can give more information more quickly, and it's a vicious temptress. Exposition, as the writer of a story, yeah. you want to just dive in and start describing everything, out of the background of everything. And the fact is that until you pitch to the audience what is happening and why it's relevant, they don't care. Right. Um, so the, the last example that you read is a great example yes. of balancing scene and exposition mm-hmm. because every we only get exposition when it becomes relevant to the scene. Right. Right? Um, a very quick way to remember the difference between these two that I usually use is uh, scene, for example, is this morning I drank too much coffee. Exposition is every morning I drank too much coffee. Right? Scene describes one moment. Exposition describes many moments. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think, that, I mean, I feel like every single piece of advice we give can come with this caveat, which is like, this is a rule that you should follow unless you're better than it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> because there's, there are absolutely authors who will just like give you exposition for just pages and pages and pages. Oh, totally. And it's great because they do something great with it. You know, maybe they just have such a compelling narrative voice, yeah. you know, that it works. Titus, but... Titus Groan, the first Gormenghast book, is one of the funniest books I've ever read, and it's like 85% exposition. That's true. Um, yeah. Everyone should uh, read those books. Everyone has time now. <laughs> that's true. They're, they're super long. Um, they're so, it's like the tone. God, they're so funny. Um, 
So to bring this back to the question, right? How, what does this actually have to do with balancing action description and dialogue? Um, the thing is that you want to be in the moment kind of as much as you can. Um, action and uh, action and dialogue are almost always in the moment, right? Description can be in the moment, right? The, you know, he sat on the blue couch. That's what he did right now. Versus uh, the house had a blue couch in it. That's a statement about the way things are, right? Um, in general, you want more of the moment by moment to balance out your story. Mm -hmm. um, if you are writing uh, in like a novel or short story style, you probably want a little bit more description or than dialogue. If you go and look at one of your favorite novels, you'll find that there actually isn't there isn't as much dialogue as you remember there being, because hmm. um, a lot of conversations are actually summarized over, and we don't need them. Um, the way to think about it is less how do I know that I've hit the golden ratio between these, um, and more uh, the thing that I'm doing right now. What is the proper tool for the job? Do I want to grab the audience and do I want to give them a lot of detail? Or is this just information they need to know and it's best if we go through it quickly? And in that case, exposition is really your tool, right? Are we going to talk more about dialogue later? Because I just remembered. We are talking more about okay, dialogue later. Okay, that'll, that'll say it then. Um, yeah, but uh, if you have any more questions about that, we will have some question time at the end too. Uh, so should we move on to the next one? Yeah. I feel like a similar theme isn't coming through the way I want it to. How do I fix it? Sophie, how do we fix it? Don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, particularly since we're talking about drafting. Since we're talking about drafting, today. yes. Uh, so to be clear, like this is, when I say don't, what I mean is if you are in the drafting stage, which presumably you all are right now if you're following mm -hmm. along with what we're doing, um, you should not be... You should not be focusing on symbols and themes. You're just telling the story. Yeah, this super is not the time for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, like, I really just strongly believe that. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a counterexample somewhere, you know. But I, I really honestly do think that if you try to write a theme or a thesis or a point of view... Yeah. Like, it's going to be inauthentic. Yeah. And I think especially if it's a thesis. I think that you can start off a story saying, I want to explore this idea. But if you were going to say that, you would better mean explore, right? Right. Like, like, just go where it takes you. Yeah. You cannot go in with a conclusion presupposed. Because even if that conclusion is right, it might not be the conclusion that your characters are ready to come to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it's going to be forced. Yeah. Um, and so, that feels very bad. So do you know what a chick tract is? No. Uh, it's by a, like, super, super fundamentalist uh, Christian um, uh, comics artist who is famous for making these comics that were basically just, like, dogma in comic form. Mm. My theory is that if you, if you, during the drafting phase, are too heavy on trying to make your specific theme or message come through, you end up with a chick tract. So I actually brought one up here that we can nice. take a look at. Um, this is just off Google Image Search. <laughs> uh, they led us into stuff we found in the Harry Potter books. Tarot cards, Ouija boards, crystal balls. Samantha, the Potter books open a doorway that will put untold millions of kids into hell. Uncle Bob, you don't know the half of it. Holly's dad is a preacher, and he likes the Harry Potter stories. Hey, what about all the occultic junk in my room? Should I destroy it? Absolutely. The, Yikes. These are, not, these are not people. Right. Right? I think that... Even if you were to agree with this point of view, these do not register as real people having a real conversation. Right. They are figureheads right. for a point. Um, so, Ooh, yeah. That's rough. Well, and also, like, I think it was our last stream, I was, like, dunking on Ayn Rand. Yes. And this is this is why. Mm -hmm. And she's somebody, I mean, she's somebody that I personally like to dunk on because I was so about Ayn Rand when I was like in high school -ish, yeah. and maybe early college too. Um, and I was like obsessed with all of her books. And if you haven't read her work, that's fine. Um, but she has like a very specific point of view and she's, she's a philosopher and um, her, her fiction very explicitly. And I think she said this, mm -hmm. her fiction very explicitly is meant to convey her philosophy. That is the point of it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at her notes and her outlines for um, 
her story and her characters, it literally says, like, this character is supposed to represent this type of person. Yeah. And here's what I'm saying about, like, humanity. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, you know, she's, it's not like she's talentless. She actually is very talented and there's some stuff in there that is good. But for the most part, um, I mean, she, she, Ayn Rand used to be much more popular and she still is in certain circles, but now I think mostly people think she's kind of silly. And I think a lot of that is because when you go in too hard with this idea of like, this is what these things are supposed to symbolize. And here is, um, you know, my thesis, I mean, she very much has a thesis for each book. It feels inauthentic and the characters feel like straw men because they're not real people who are developing in the way that real people do. They're all in service of your point. And I know that's very tempting, like, especially because we'll look at Ayn Rand and be like, oh, well, I don't agree with her point of view. So like, of course it's silly, but that's actually not the point. You can have a great point of view that I agree with, (laughs) you know, and it's still not going to make for a good story. Yeah. Structurally, Ayn Rand's stories like are like they feel like satisfying kind of pulpy thrillers, mm-hmm. right? And so they're they're fun until you get to individual moments that are just about the philosophy, and suddenly you have the world bending over backwards and characters acting in ways that do not make any sense for them, literally just to get the point across. Right, and one of the things she's infamous for is like I think in almost every book there comes a point where the main character will deliver a speech, like a long, long for time. just like thirty pages, mm-hmm. and it's like wh- why would anyone listen to them right yep. right it's like they're in court or something yep. and like getting on the stand like giving a 30 page long speech that has nothing to do with what they're being you know prosecuted for or whatever right and everyone just like sits and is like and that doesn't make any sense that's just in there so that she can get her point across right but it doesn't make any sense for any of the characters right so just philosophy aside i think that the fact that she goes into it attempting to get across a philosophy right uh, whereas and we're not going to say that you can't make a point but where uh, we're saying literally you that can you cannot be worrying about that right now. Yeah, the story comes first. You need to tell a good story yes. and then later on we'll talk about this later, but you do a lot of basically connecting the dots, mm-hmm. right? What do I already have here? Yeah, and what, the dots will just happen. They will. You and then you get them. to connect them later. Yep. Um but and and sometimes and like that that that's part of I think the beauty of it, right? Like totally. sometimes you will discover something in the writing that you didn't know at the outset. And if you had just decided it and made everything bend in service of that, you would, you would not learn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll, we'll table this for now. We'll come back to it in a little bit. Ready for the next question? Yes. How do you choose which point of view to stick with throughout the story? Mm. Um, the person who asked this was specifically asking about how do you choose if you need a first person narrator, third person narrator, etc. cetera. Um, the very, very quick answer for me to that question is, you know, first person obviously lets you, uh, makes it so that every sentence is also characterization for the narrator, right? Uh, first person sentences end up doing a lot of double duty in that way. So if it's very, very character centric, first person could be really useful to you, but that doesn't mean that you can't use third person. My best piece of advice at this point is pick one and then let that inform your story instead of needing, feeling like you need to pick the right one for your story. Um, I brought up, uh, I put together this little thing to help you think about it too, because beyond first, you can write a second person story, there are some really good ones, um, uh, or third person. There are also these two other uh, kind of axes to think about, right? Um, your perspective in whatever person you're doing can be omniscient, meaning that it uh, bounces between narrators every, if it's all the way up there, whatever anybody is thinking is fair game for the narrator to say. It can be limited, where your perspective is only limited to one person, right? Um, For the most part, Second Citadel episodes are fairly limited, even Mm -hmm. though we have an ensemble cast, because we pick one person we're following them. Mm -hmm. Um, It can also be close, which means that you hear, you're very close inside their head, you're hearing everything they're thinking, or it can be very distant, right? Uh, they're very far away from you. You don't really hear what they're thinking. Um, I would say that in the Juno series, we are like down here. Uh, we are. It's a very, very close, limited point of view. You're so in someone's head that when they're wrong, you don't realize it. Right? Yes. I mean, we're not quite as close as you possibly could be because sometimes, um, for example, in the Juno series, like Juno will say things but not explain them to us. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 
So we're a little bit, we're, we're kind of over here. Yeah, which is something, you know, you can, so like that, then you can also think about like what kind of tension you want to create, what kind of mystery you want to create. Mm -hmm. um, and is it the, the type of mystery, I, I'm not saying that you have to be writing a mystery story, but yeah. in any genre of story, there is like an element of mystery often, just things that you don't know. And is it going to be more interesting to you to know everything that your character knows, but be stuck in their point of view like mm -hmm. they might not understand other people's actions or words um or are we far enough away from that our main character that we're following that we don't understand everything about them right and the the other thing that i'll say so you're you're absolutely right right and in a lot of ways the perspective can really assist what you're trying to do and also, you know, you shouldn't feel like you, this shouldn't be another decision that you get totally paralyzed on. The no, day. just let it. You can just pick. Because even, you know, people immediately recognize the the um, style of the Juno series at the start as noir. But if you go and read most noir novels, they're really like over here. Um, like all of uh, like Dashiell Hammett's uh, and more Dashiell Hammett than, than Raymond Carver. Um, but uh, not Raymond Carver, whatever. Uh, the, like all, like the Maltese Falcon, all of those, like you follow the PI, but you have no idea what he's thinking. Right. You don't know what his plan is until he's doing it. Right. Um, so when we took on the Juno series, and we put it over here, it's still recognizably that kind of story, even though we've really changed the rules. Well, but also I think we're in <clears throat> that POV, we're following more audio drama. That's true. Like That's there's more audio drama. Mm hmm. Um, so let it inform what you want to do, right? Think about the, the, the strengths of each of these perspectives. Pick one. Or switch. Yeah, bounce If that's out. interesting to you, you could write your first two seasons from one character's point of view, for example, and then start hopping around. That sounds like it would make a lot of people mad. <laughs> it does seem like it would make people mad. <laughs> uh, who would do that? Um, yeah, so that's that's point of view. Um these two questions I put together because I actually think they're related. How do you make sure your character voices are distinct, both internal and external? And how do you write an unreliable narrator without blindsiding the audience? Mm. Um, Love an unreliable narrator. Do you have a Do you have a gut feeling about this? Um, no, I'm curious about how I think they're related. Yeah, and why you put them together. The reason that I put them together is because I would argue that all narrators are unreliable. Uh, yes, that I is, like that. Yeah, if if you have a Especially if the narrator's a character in the story. If it's just a like third person narrator who has no personality, they're still not completely without bias, right? They're they're picking what details to show and what details not to show. But if your narrator's a character in the story, they are always, always, always unreliable. It doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna lie to you, but it does mean that if they see something incorrectly or if they're lying to themselves, the audience gets that. Everything needs to come through the filter of them, right? Um, so how you write an, an unreliable narrator without blindsiding the audience is you still try to follow the basic storytelling rules where, um, you know, even the, even when we get to the moments where we realize that the narrator was wrong or was lying to us, there are details before them that we can look back at and say, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I should have seen that coming, right? Um, so any kind of setup that you can pull off, uh, a lot of what we do when... Um, when Juno is just totally wrong and he's narrating mm -hmm. is we will either make it incredibly obvious that he's wrong. He'll just be straight up like hypocritical or we will um, put a detail early on in the episode that kind of shows that he's wrong mm -hmm. and he may have just forgotten it. Right. Yeah. There's, yeah, because like some things, I mean, like, I guess nothing is, is really objective, even dialogue, like, you mm -hmm. know, because a character might have misremembered or, or they might be misrepresenting it. Um, but sometimes that can be a technique that you use is like, you'll get the dialogue, which is as objective mm -hmm. as we, as we can get. And then the narrator's interpretation of it might not be your interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. And then you, you feel the disparity between that. Yeah. And then you can tell it's an unreliable narrator. Absolutely. Yeah. My favorite unreliable narrator is uh, Humbert Humbert from Lolita. Nice, bringing out all the controversial takes today. <laughs> yes, Lolita is my favorite book, and that is part of why. Mm -hmm. um, and if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, it's worth noting that because that book has a has a real reputation. I think with people who haven't read it, that like the 
the narrator is trying to get the audience to sympathize with him, but also he's very clearly a monster. Yeah, you're, I mean, I, I am typically annoyed by the concept that we're not supposed to, like, that we're supposed to sympathize with him. Like, mm-hmm. we're, like... We're, we we kind of are in the sense that, like, it's easy to sympathize with him, but we're not right. supposed to, like, agree with what he does. I mean, it's terrible. Right. Um, but, like, that's that disparity between the presentation and the content, mm-hmm. that's what makes such a fantastic, unreliable narrator. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, What's your favorite my unreliable favorite, narrator? My favorite unreliable narrator. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, give me a minute. Okay. And we'll come back to it. Do you want to talk a little bit about distinct character voices? Um, because you think about this from the the acting and directing standpoint, but I think that there are things yes. that you think about there that are useful to think about for writing. Um, well, this is something that I've said a lot before, and I think we've already said it on streams, but like one thing sometimes is just to pull from your memories of either a real person or a type of person or a character that you know of without stealing any actual lines Mm -hmm. um but like if you take your memory of that and you're trying to put that down on paper it will come through your own filter and it will end up being different and that's often a really good starting place Mm -hmm. for a character voice uh like what we talked about with um for buddy just being like all right we're gonna start with Catherine hepburn and we're gonna see where it takes us and then it just ends up becoming its own character as you continue to write because it's coming out of you yeah I'd say also the the the, the word distinct there de- uh, depends on style. So I would say that our style is everybody's voice is extremely distinct. Yes, um, and part of that we do because we like it, and part of it we do out of what we think is necessity right. for our format, which is audio drama. And you may have experienced this before, but like sometimes when you're just listening to something, it becomes impossible to tell people apart unless there is something making it incredibly clear. So we try really hard. Right, and also we, we also just think it's funny when Damien yeah, says like when Damien says forsooth and Rilla responds, "All right, dude." Like, <laughs> right. Um, so, but you get to pick. I think that in if you go and look at some of your favorite novels again, um, a lot of the like best written novels in a very realistic space end up uh, the voices don't actually sound that dissimilar. It's what they're talking about and the characterization that makes them feel very dissimilar. So don't torment yourself thinking like another character could say this exact line because they'd probably say it a different way, right? It sort of depends on how far you want to take it with your mm-hmm. style. Um, I thought about my answer. Okay, what? Uh, there are sections of White Teeth by Zadie Smith oh. where that's a third person narrator, yeah. but it's a very close third person narrator. Mm-hmm. And since it's so in the character's heads, um, that book really plays around the fact that you're bouncing around between perspectives. So you'll see something very clearly one way with one character, and then you'll see them from the outside with another character, and they'll look like just a complete doofus. Um, and I, I love that, because yeah. you fall in love with all the characters, yes. and you recognize they're all extremely flawed. Yes. Right? Um, yeah, and that's, a, that's an example of like jumping around from character to character, like being close third on one character for a chapter and then close third on another for a chapter. Mm -hmm. And that works really well. Yeah. Love that book. Yeah, read that book too. Real good. (laughs) Um, So those are character voices. What should I be aiming for when I write action scenes? Action's hard, especially in audio. My God. Uh, The script that I was stuck on most recently that I think I, I referenced last time I eventually realized towards the end the reason I was stuck on it is because there's a lot of action in it. It's it's really hard to write. It requires you to choreograph and also to get across, like, in audio, what do these actions sound like? Have characters called out what they're doing too often? Right. Um, and it's... it's Well, I think in tough. audio, you're working with a massive handicap. Yeah. And, like, you can do it, but hopefully not everybody has to write for audio all the time because it's like the worst, the worst format to have to write action in. Um, I I would, I think we talked about this briefly a little while ago, but, uh, you know, think about that plot arc again, Uh, even in like, you know, weirdly a place where I feel like I learned a lot about writing action scenes was, um, uh, was like dumb men punching each other anime that I watched a lot when I was a teenager and still watch some of. Um, but because like the arcs for those fights, 
they tend to follow the same pattern, right? Someone, one person clearly starts winning, the other person picks it up, there's a twist, the first person starts winning again, right? It just sort of, it, it goes through that the whole, the whole way through. Um, so ultimately, you want to keep the tension rising by keeping the audience kind of guessing and surprising them throughout. Um, but also, your action scene does not need to be your whole story. So when, it's, when you're out of twists, the action scene might just be over. Uh, and you get to move on to the next part, right? The rope is a snake. The rope is a snake. Yeah, even like in the context of within that scene. Absolutely. Um, anything else you want to say about action scenes? No, I don't write action scenes. <laughs> and this is our last question. What do I do if I get stuck? Mm. I bet there are people out there that are feeling that right now. Um, what, what, do, what do we do if we get stuck? What, or let, me, let me ask you this, because you can see me from the outside. What do I do when I get stuck when I'm drafting something? Um, you make me read it. That's true. Why do you think that's useful to me? Well, it often... Well, first of all, sometimes what's stopping you is just, like, your own mental state. Mm -hmm. And, like, you think everything you're writing is bad and you're going in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. And you should just, like, scrap this. Yeah. And sometimes it's as simple as you show it to me and I'm like, oh, I love it. Yeah. And you're like... Great, I love it too. <laughs> like you keep writing, and that's a that's an easy out. Um, and that does happen sometimes. You know, sometimes you just get stuck in your own head about something. Mm -hmm. That was definitely the history of the last two parter mm -hmm. that I was stuck on. Especially if you're like psychologically having a hard time in general, unrelated yes. to writing, mm -hmm. um, and then you might just be starting to feel like everything you're writing is terrible, and yeah. somebody else can really help you get out of your head. Yeah. Um, sometimes. It's not good, and you do need help. Yeah. Um, and then it's helpful to get a second set of eyes to help you find a way out of it. Like, pinpoint what is not working. Right. You refocus on the tension, find the story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it might be that you took a side road because you were really interested in this piece of character development. Mm -hmm. um, but if it turns out that that side road doesn't go anywhere, you might have to cut it. You might just have to cut it and go back to the main story and start again. Um, so having somebody look at it, is a helpful thing. Hopefully, you know, you all have made groups and do have another person to look at things for you. But even if you don't have another person, that other person can be you. It's yeah. just, that's the point at which you say, okay, I'm not going to look at this mm -hmm. for a couple days. Mm -hmm. um, I would say don't look at it for a couple days and consume other media you care about. Yes. Which often like... Yeah, consume other, other media you care about. If you're in an emotional state where watching or reading your favorite things just makes you depressed, don't do that. Uh, but sometimes I find that just like running my mind through analyzing just whatever it is I'm seeing, right? Even if I just turn something on that is pretty dumb and mindless and like just kind of trying to track how it works will really help me bring, will help really help bring me back in. Yeah. Yeah. Those are our questions that I pulled from the Discord. Uh, but those are not all of our questions for today. Before we do that, though, uh, let's talk about your your stuck at home, so you might as well do this work. This is the big one. The full draft of your story is due before our workshop on the 9th oh, of May. Oh, my gosh. That's two weeks from today. Oh, my gosh. So a full draft is the full story, beginning, end, and as much of the middle as you think it needs. Remember, if you get stuck, you can write out of order also. Uh, if you've already finished one, I want you to write another. It might be that you write a lot of short things. That's okay. I don't want you to worry about how long you think it should be, though. For now, just write. Talk to your group if you get stuck and submit sections that you're proud of, okay? Uh, for the future, if you could submit sections that are around like 500-ish words long or less, that would be great. Um, and I think we're probably going to start the next couple streams, similarly to how we did today with, with yeah. a couple of readings. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, so this this is the big show, y'all. Uh, it's, it's exciting. You're going to have full drafts. Full drafts. And it's, <gasps> it's exciting and it's terrifying. Yes. And that's okay. But like everyone's already doing such a great job. Yes. Totally. And I really think getting started is, yes, you know, that's the hardest part. Yeah, absolutely. So now we want to take questions from you all about anything that we talked about today or if there's anything else that you're curious about the drafting process that you want us to talk about. Uh, then you can put those over in the uh, Discord, in the general, or no, not general, in the sorry, live, live, the live channel. channel. Can you um, can you do David S. Pumpkins again? Can I do David S. Pumpkins? Yeah, and say any questions. Oh, uh, any questions? <laughs> I don't know, I can be one of the skeletons. The, the skeletons, <laughs> they're part of it. Um, that means pretty old now, isn't it? 
I don't know. It's pretty old SNL sketch. Yeah, yeah. sketch. Yeah, uh-huh. but it's so good, and yeah. I wish it was Halloween. It's precious. Uh, so uh, head over to the live channel, ask questions. We're specifically thinking uh, questions about drafting. Yeah. Even if they are specific to your draft, I think that's fine for today. Um, so if you're stuck on something specifically, feel free to write the question down. We'll help you out. Um, and any questions that we think will be more for the revision period of time, we might call out a couple of them and say that. Uh, but for the most part, we're focusing on drafting today. Drafting. Drafting. Yay. Okay, we have a couple coming in. I'm going to wait a little bit. Interesting. Ku or Su. I've never known how to say this person's name because I've definitely called on them before. But is it possible to do rope as a snake wrong? How is that avoided? That's a good question. Wrong? What are some twists that have felt really unsatisfying to you? Can you think of any? Mm. Or like cheap? Okay, yeah, I well, I guess that's the answer, kind of. Yeah. Like, if it if it feels like there was nothing supporting that, like, you you don't feel like it had anything to do with what came before. Yeah. Um, it wasn't supported by things we've seen before from that character, that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that doesn't feel good. Right. I think that an audience will forgive a lot and will accept a lot so long as, after the fact, they can tell themselves they saw it coming. Uh, so any hints before the rope is a snake moment that that is a potential threat, I think almost always justifies you. I don't want to say, I mean, you know, I, I could tell me if you think I'm wrong. I don't want to say like be coming up with hints as you go. Mm. Um, but like when you, I think it's more that like when you do a rope is a snake moment, mm-hmm. you want to do it by pulling on things that you have established right before. I, I think it, I think it's both because it's uh, or if you think of a really good rope as a snake moment but you haven't justified it then remember no nobody needs to read your first draft you right. can go back and justify it before right. anybody takes a look and then you look like a genius even though you're <laughs> a knucklehead like us um, so yeah I think any kind of setup to, to, to get the audience ready for that payoff can be really helpful um see uh holly not holly asks how long do you think an ideal sprint should take like taking 10 minutes to write and see how much you wrote during this time that totally depends on the person and your mood for the day um i am very much a person where i so like like the way that you work sophie really is like you work with distractions and you kind of get it done over the course of a day really long time yeah i I am like you need no distractions i need to be in a totally like quiet or just music room with nobody else in it and like i will some days i sprint for like 45 minutes straight um and it's exhausting um but also i don't think everybody should do that right it what that leads to is the fact that like I think I write a lot, but I also really only have it in me for like an hour or two of writing a day, um, maybe like two or three. Uh, but even when that's like my my full time job, um, so it totally depends on you, right? Find find a system that works for you and keep at it. Um, okay, so I want to give us a minute to come up with answers to this question. Oh, that's good. Um, so I'm just going to call your attention to it and. Then look at, I'm going to look at our bookshelf while you answer the next question and then we'll switch. Okay. Um, so, Eau Claire asks, should you read slash revise lightly while you draft? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny to look at on the camera. Um, no one look at me. So, uh, I mean, the answer is, yeah, I, I, do, I do read and revise lightly when I draft. I think that you need to watch your own process. If you get really paralyzed fixing stuff that happened earlier, then you need to go completely cold turkey on, um, on reading what you've already written while you're drafting. Um, I needed to train myself to get to a point where, uh, you know, if I am writing a scene and I'm not sure about it, I can go back and add something a little bit earlier that makes it a little bit more exciting. Um, so I edit a little bit as I go. But the first draft is really just about telling the story. Um, so everything is really kind of in, in service of that. If I think I need to reread a section to refresh my memory or to inject some tension into a later scene, I'll do it. But 
I avoid it where I can, I guess. Um, okay, I will start taking the next question, if, or unless you have an answer. Do you have an answer already? Uh, I don't. Okay, then I'm going to let you think about that. Fair. Um, so, <gasps> a, oh, goodbye. <laughs> I, I gotta go all the way over here. Wait, you can't turn around? Whatever. Um, Ace, they, them, um, asks, do you change how you approach these things based on what genre you're writing? I think not based on genre very much. Um, you might you might change things a little bit depending on um, like your point of view character if you're doing first person or third person. Um, but but genre no. Like I, I think that these these tips should apply regardless of genre. Any progress? We look so nuts right now. <laughs> I have I have one real answer and two answers I think are true, but they might be cheating a little bit. Okay, well, all right. So the question, since you're all wondering, uh, the question that was asked by H.G. the Lesbian are, uh, is, what are three books that all writers must read? And I don't have a great... If I had, like, thought about this beforehand, I'd have better answers. Right. And what I'm going to give you is probably more just some of my favorite books. Yep. Uh, with justifications. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to re-say the one I said before, which is Lolita, and I really do think that everyone should read that. It's just like, it's it's just such a masterclass and an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. um, which, tying into what you said about how basically all narrators are unreliable narrators, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really useful mm -hmm. to pick apart how Nabokov does that. Mm -hmm. So, highly recommend Lolita. Um I think, especially if you are interested in adaptation, mm -hmm. um, in not just writing something completely out of nowhere, but taking um, an existing story and adapting it, I would really recommend The Once and Future King, uh, which is... Good pull. Yeah. Very good pull. Um, which is based on Arthurian legends, mm -hmm. uh, which don't... which come from multiple sources and don't make any sense. You're shaking the screen. You know what? Let it <laughs> shake! <laughs> um, pulls from multiple sources um, and like those legends contradict each other and they don't make sense and there's no clear timeline uh, but T.H. White in The Once and Future King has taken the characters and the plot lines from the Arthurian legends and kind of tied them together to make a cohesive story. Um, it's kind of anachronistic. Uh, it has a beautifully developed world it has so many characters but they're all so strong mm -hmm. um and it, it covers a, a very large span of time too mm -hmm. which um i think is a helpful thing to look at as a writer yeah absolutely um and i will also say uh i mean this is just another favorite of mine but gone with the wind um Something that I really like about that is I'm very much a sucker for stories that are um, a, an individual's life. Yeah. On the what? You're you're bringing out literally every single one of your of your like uh, of your controversial book list today. Oh, I'm sure I have more. Yeah. You. <laughs> um. Yeah. Anyway, it it does one of my favorite things, which is taking an individual's story and putting it against um, a backdrop of like world shaking events. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that, but that is one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to be no fun and preface my question by saying that I don't think all writers must read these. Uh, I do think it sort of depends on what you're going for, but three books that really helped me are um, one bizarrely is actually the autobiography of Chuck Jones, uh, Chuck Amuck, the life and times of an animated cartoonist. Uh, Chuck Jones is like the the creator of like Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner and a bunch of other things. Um, and he's not talking about the writing process really. He's talking about the creative process in general and working in a group. Um, and that was one of the first things I read that got me really interested in, in working collaboratively. But also, there are tons of things that he talks about about the creative process that I think that when they're abstracted a little bit, when it's when you're looking at it at a different field as opposed to just writing, I learned a lot more from that than I did from some other really good books uh, about writing, like uh, like Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott is mm -hmm. is quite good. But because it's so about writing, it was like 
it felt a little hard to to get into it if at the beginning I felt like I didn't know what I was doing when I was writing. Yeah. Um, Part of a chore. Yeah. Um, there are some there's some great stuff in Chuck Muck. Um, for me, I would say that one thing that I really aim for is very charming, very flawed characters, um, and I really think I learned I learned that from White Teeth. Mm. Um, to the extent that I can do it. That is one of my favorite novels of all time. Um, and it's just so good. Uh, if you want to learn about how to make a bunch of characters that are both the worst and also you're rooting for every single one of them, yeah. um, it just just such a, such a lovely book. Um, and then the third thing that I'd recommend is the kind of cheating answer. Uh, you got to go read something you hate. You have to go read the book that you are afraid of going to read because you're convinced you're not going to like it. Um, because you will learn a lot if you open yourself up to those. That is actually something that you really pushed me to do. Uh, and I really appreciate it. That's part of why I keep commenting on your controversial takes today. <laughs> right? Is that um, there is, there's a ton of ugly stuff in, in those books. And also there are lessons that I learned from them that I don't think I could have gotten anywhere else. So I think that you do need to sign yourself up for if there is a book or, or, or a couple books or whatever that you are saying, no, 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 never, never, ever, ever. Um, you're basically saying these are writing skills I never want to learn. Yeah. Uh, this is an influence I, I never want to have, even if I can take good things from that influence and make, you know, make the world and make my creation better for it. And also, right? like, you can look at stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> You right, know, absolutely. And, and figure out why and learn from that. And like, I mean, you know, we're, we're not recommending like, don't like, don't read things that you know are going to trigger you. Yes. But read, but do read things that you know will make you uncomfortable. Yes. It is good to be made uncomfortable. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like embrace that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, if you don't, then you're just like, it's going to get cushy and yeah, it won't be interesting. If you only read things you agree with, you never have a reason to question yourself. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, oh, how do you, uh, Gold Rogue asks, how do you decide what kind of voice you want for a character and what do you do to implement it? And what kinds of words choi word choices do you do to distinguish a voice like Peter Narev from Bespa or Juno? That's a really good question. Well, I think that sometimes, like, you can do it two ways because you can either, um, if you have a sense of a character, you can do it by thinking about what kind of voice would make sense for them, or you can give them a voice that you like, yes. that interests you, and that will tell you something about the character. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, very often it's enough of a hook to start to just write a character voice that is fun. I mean, that's where we started with Jet, for sure. It's just that, like, when he finally started talking, he was, like lovable and hilarious and terrifying and yeah. so like the, but and at that point we had slight inklings of some of his backstory but certainly not the way that it's fleshed out in season three mm -hmm. but we that's a case of letting the voice help dictate yes. the backstory for us right it was just fun to begin with and then it was like oh why would a person yeah. be like that and i think that's so much of <clears throat> developing a character and like not having it all planned out ahead of time right you know just like it's like when you meet a person and they already are a person they already talk the way that they do and then when you get to know them you find out what made them that way yeah it's the same thing absolutely of. yeah there are lots of there are lots of other things that you can consider i think that I, I talked about this earlier a little bit but i think that one thing that people really freeze up on is they feel like every character's voice needs to be extremely different they really don't, and it's because of the context. So this is partially helped by the fact that we have actors who end up reading our words. Right. But we've had multiple characters that, um, for the sake of kind of establishing a comparison with somebody else, we've walked into it being like, each line they say should be a line that you could give to Juno. Mm. Right. That's uh, in fact we cast, we cast both uh, Sarah Steele and Ben Zeitlin Steele with Juno monologues. Yes. Um, That's true. And I think that when I finally figured out Vespa's voice when she was talking for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. her out loud voice, almost all of her lines could be said by Juno. Yeah. Her internal voice is extremely different. Right. And then that ended up being a thing about them. Yeah. That they were similar. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, maybe you've already answered this, but in case you haven't, Almond asks, how long slash how many words is your daily, weekly, etc. goal? How do you keep writing consistently? 
my goal for uh, my goal for a very long time has been a thousand words a day. Um, I will say that by the end of the week, I probably average seven thousand. Um, but like, for example, since we started doing these, uh, I absolutely love these workshops, and after them, I'm so tired that no writing is going to happen today. Um, but I did I did some extra over the last couple of days, right? Um, I aim for a thousand. I know a lot of writers who aim for five hundred, uh, and it just it's because I really sprint through drafts and then I go back and fix them up. Um, so I write I, I write a lot of garbage before I get to the good stuff. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Um, it was how do you keep writing consistently? Um, making it a habit and telling myself I have to do it even if I don't want to is the biggest thing. Um, there are days where, like yesterday, I got through like a thousand two hundred words in like in like an hour, maybe forty five minutes. The two days before that, it took me three and a half hours to get that far. Um, I just make myself sit there and do it. And if I'm like, if I'm really really getting upset, I'll go for a walk or I'll say, okay, maybe I need to pick up these words tomorrow, uh, the the lost words today tomorrow. Um, but that is my system. It works for me because I've adapted it over time as I've figured out what I can do and what I can't do. You should not take that as a prescription for you. Um, try it and then figure out, are you so tired that your days are not worth living? Because <laughs> if they are, tone it down. Uh, are you, and, and so on, right? Um, and you also have some positive reinforcement built in because you'll be like, I did this many words today. And I'll be like, yay! That's true. I have the positive reinforcement built in. Uh, also, lately, I've gotten very into an old game series, and I tell myself I'm not allowed to play it until mm. I finish my writing for the yeah, day. Yeah, reward systems. Yeah, um, they work. You just need to, you just need to actually enforce them, which is yeah. the hard part. Yeah. Um. You go for like ten more minutes, you think? Sure. Yeah. Um, Elena asks, if time skips aren't an option, how do you deal with writing? What happens when it's necessarily a bit slow going? Example: walking. A lot of the time you don't have to. A lot of time you can just skip it. I'm just curious. I, I don't really know the context of what she's writing. If time skips aren't an option, I don't know how. I don't know how literally to take that. Like, are we not allowed to skip any moment, or is it just we're not we're trying not to go a year forward? Let's take the most extreme version of the question because I think you can you can still get away. You can still do a lot in the most extreme version, which is that you can't even skip five minutes into the future. Um, this is something that I had to be, I had to have pointed out to me because it was not obvious to me. But if you go and look at uh, some, of, some of the books that you own or whatever, you will find a crazy amount of description of action that is like two people having a conversation in the bedroom and like the, the, the dialogue ends, end quotation. And then the next sentence is, in the living room, they sat down and blah, 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 right? They don't say, I wa they walked to the living room. Right. Because when they're in the bedroom talking, and then you say, in the living room... We know they got there. Right. And they, we know that they didn't drive there. We know that they didn't jump there, right? There are tons of things that the reader can fill in on their own. Um, so for a lot of really small actions like that, you really got to ask yourself just how important is it? And does it matter if different readers imagine it differently, Right. Like, and trust the reader. Trust them, yes. To figure stuff out. Yeah. Um, okay. I would say that in general, readers are much more tolerant of being confused and bored. Oh, uh, the follow-up was, if they're not part of your style generally, like two hours later is, is what, what I meant. Oh, yeah. No, you shouldn't, you shouldn't need those, uh, I don't think. Um, you can very often... You, I mean, you can very often signpost with short phrases like that that feel kind of awkward when you're writing them, but in context, they're invisible to the audience, so it doesn't matter. Or there are other things that will clue them in to when it's happening right. that aren't, it was two hours later. Right. The sun was low by the time work had finished that day. Right. Right. Or like, now they're eating lunch. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to call out the amount of time, you can figure out a different like image signpost that shows us that time has passed right um sun's useful for that uh meals are useful for that yeah um okay what gold rogue asks what do you do personally when you feel a scene isn't going anywhere or it just feels flatter than usual 
I skip it. Oh yeah, that's true. I skip it. I'll write. I'll write the next one. Um, some of my writing days. In fact, probably the slowest writing days are the days when I will just write individual lines across a bunch of scenes, and it feels like kind of planting seeds for those scenes. And then on faster writing days, I will just focus in on one yeah. and just go. Yeah. Um, so if I'm writing a scene and it feels flat and I don't get it, um, and I, I really can't figure it out, I basically just tell myself, all right, today Kevin's too dumb to figure this out. Maybe tomorrow Kevin can figure it out. <laughs> Uh, and I'm gonna go do something. I'm gonna go write something else. Yeah. Right. Um. Is there any way to imply complexity in supporting characters that you don't have time to develop? That's a really good question. I'm just remembering like writing something and showing it to you and being like, "Why is this so bad?" And like one thing you pointed out was I had, like, an extra in the scene. It was, like, the doctor that, like, came in and mm -hmm. said something. And you were like, well, that doctor is, like, just, like, just playing the role of doctor. They're not... Right. They're only saying the doctor thing and nothing else, and there's nothing about them other than the fact that they're a doctor. And, like, of course that's flat. Right. And, you know, it might be the case that the majority of people that you meet, like, if you just go into the emergency room and meet a doctor mm -hmm. are you going to remember them mm -hmm. like two days later maybe not just a doctor but when we're reading a story we want a heightened version of that reality yes right so you know it doesn't mean spend 50 hours on talking about like all the doctor's favorite jokes but even if the doctor just has like some pins on his lapel right or like opens the situation by making an uncomfortable joke that is specifically <laughs> uncomfortable for your main character right um, very often using these characters as ways to right. explore your main characters, right. making so that their quirks interact with what your main character they has going on, yeah. um, can be really helpful. Yes, that's very good. Oh, also, the, we didn't end up talking more about dialogue in the way that I thought we were going to, but I remember, you reminded me of the thing that I was going to say about dialogue, which is something that someone said in one of the writing workshops we were in in college mm -hmm. about dialogue, which is, um, that dialogue shouldn't be literally conversation it should be conversation's greatest hits yes and that was such a good piece of advice mm -hmm. because there's if you write really really <laughs> realistic dialogue it's pretty bad it's <laughs> it's boring and the person who's saying it sounds like kind of a moron yeah so like you can you can get away with some characters speaking really realistically if you want them to sound if somebody really transcribed really everything i said yeah. it would be very embarrassing yeah so you want you don't want me to show that to you. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Um, how, Eli Summers asks, how do you tell if you hate the story you're drafting or if you're just burned out with it? Um, That's a good I, question. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a specific way to know. I don't think so either. I think that, in my experience, and this has more to do with what I know my flaws in the writing process are, if I'm lying to myself about the story, that's not a good sign. If I'm writing something and there is like an, a, a plot moment coming up and I'm like, yeah, I'll figure that out. I know how to make this work, but I really know that I'm not going to, that's not a good sign. Um, it took me a very long time to be able to see that. I would say I've only just within the past like year and a half been able to see it consistently um and you've been able to see it a little better yes in me and yes. in both of us yes um do the stephen king thing and uh kill off half of the yeah then you'll know yeah for real um you know if even if the story even if the story is flat f finish the draft even if you finish a sketch of the draft right like just jump to the scenes that you know about and if you're writing your favorite scenes of the story and you're like i just don't care um that is a sign that you might be burned out um and you and you need to step away for a little bit always try just stepping away and, yeah and see if you feel better about it later mm -hmm. um how do you figure out when to end a scene and when you're dragging it too long um in terms of drafting you don't in terms of drafting you let it go on too long uh, and then you cut it down later. 
um, when I'm revising, I usually think about like one of the things that we have to really, or I guess all writers have to think about to an extent, is that we need to cram a lot into a very small space. Our episodes are long by podcast standards, um, but in terms of how much we want to do, uh, like there, the seven thousand words that I aim for in an episode is uh, is not is not very much. Um, so I think that I uh, I ask so for each scene, I really have to ask myself like. What does the scene need to accomplish? What's the point? And at the end, I look at, did I accomplish it? And sometimes those accomplishments are plot things. Sometimes their information has to be revealed. Sometimes it's these two characters have to get along slightly better. Um, and that last one can often take the longest because you're trying to get them to talk and they just like at cross purposes and it's not working. Uh, and But eventually you get there, right? Um, I guess for me, I, I can only really tell once I'm sure that the scene has accomplished what it needs to, and it kind of feels comfortable to enter and exit, right? Flashing sideways to a scene that lasts two seconds is you're asking the audience to like adjust their brain to where they're at in that moment, but then we leave that moment so fast that they don't get a payoff for it, mm. right? Um, it's kind of what I think about, I guess. Let's take two more. All right. Cecil Bluejorts asks, along the lines of voices, how do you make sure to keep with a voice when you're switching from them being a background character to when they're narrating, like we've done in season three? Manage to keep with a voice. Like keep it consistent, maybe? Because we don't. We actually very specifically don't. Well, right. Like people's yeah. internal thoughts don't necessarily sound like how they speak. And sometimes that's the point, yes. that they sound different when they talk out loud. Um, we, I'd say we started... We started that with Juno, but we didn't notice we were doing it for a long time. I well, I don't think it's as nearly as pronounced yeah. with Juno. It's quite pronounced with Vespa. Very pronounced with Vespa. Very pronounced with Jet. Um, it's also... The other character that it's really, really intense for is actually Sir Caroline. When Sir Caroline is writing letters, oh. she will go on and she will get That's poetic. True. When Sir Caroline's speaking, everything yeah. is very terse and it's clipped and it's just the information that I need. And if you're annoying me, I will eviscerate you in five words or less <laughs> right um right because people aren't always people don't always see themselves the same way that other people see them right so i guess i would say a in terms of you know if they're jumping from side character to narrator um don't worry too much about consistency like figure out how it is they actually think because how they think might not be how they speak mm -hmm. um and the other thing is, actually, even if you're just continuing to write the dialogue for a character, don't worry too, too much about whether everything that they say is in character, because what might be happening is they might be changing. Mm. Um, and if they're changing and you keep on bringing the hammer down and saying, like, no, you need to sound like you did in the first story we ever got you in, then the only change that can happen is when you flip the big, like, character development lever and suddenly they're speaking with a whole different register of speech, right? And let it, them. Just let them. Let them. Let them. And let yourself, right? Like, our, Juno in the first couple episodes was uh, trying to act cool and kind of much more of a jerk in ways that aren't as cute. Um, and part of that was us figuring out the character, but part of that was also just, like, us growing up. Yeah, we changed. Yeah. Because we started writing when we were 25, <laughs> and now we are... 30 or almost 30 and that's a pretty big difference and so big like difference. the characters have changed yep yeah uh okay last question lady dominic asks hi dads <laughs> thank you i didn't actually mean to read that part out loud but i'm glad i did if you've got a close limited narrator how can you make sure that you manage to accurately show what a character is really like without breaking away from the narrator's voice it's in contrast i think yeah. right you you have to get stuff from other characters. And that doesn't mean you have to get into their heads. It just means you have to like hear what they say mm -hmm. and how they react to your narrator. Yeah. Um, and you'll see when that doesn't necessarily line up with how your narrator is presenting themselves or right. how they think of themselves. Um, so you do it through other characters and um, yeah. And I guess through like, uh, more factual things, um, you know, like if the narrator 
this is a bad example, but if the narrator says like, I always do really, really well in all my classes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, later on they say like, and I folded down the corner of my test to cover the like 67. Yeah. You, right. That was a fact. Right. The test, the score. Yeah. And what they said about themselves was different. Yeah. You put it up against measurables. And in fact, uh, that can actually be a really good exercise for you to try if you feel like you're really relying on the narrator also giving value judgments, right? This person was like this, the narrator says. Um, and in general, it can be more satisfying to a reader if they can figure it out on their own from like facts in the world that you put in, what people say about them, what they do, what they say, etc. And the narrator just coming out and saying what they're like uh, is really, I would say, last option. That's if, if you've got nothing else, you yep. can go there. Um, he's even when Juno talks about himself, like he's wrong, right? Like most of the time. Well, right, especially because he pretty much always comes to a like, and here's you know what I think now at the end of this episode, and it's like always wrong. Right, I was wrong before, but now I've got it all figured out. Yeah, self growth is done. <laughs> right, like, infamously at the end of Midnight Fox. Yes. Right, where he's like, all right, I'm not going to get bogged down in that anymore. Yeah. In Don't mess around with people from your past. In... Don't have feelings. In Midnight Fox, I had a lot of fun hamming that up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's unreliable narrator, even though it's very, very close right. and first person. Right, and even though he does not lie intentionally to the audience. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Cool. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you for submitting your draft. Thank you for your questions. You're all doing so great. You really are. Yeah, and we just, we love getting to do this with you. Next week is going to be similar to this week, but it's going to be a little bit more focused. We want to start kind of bridging the gap over into things that are kind of halfway between drafting and revision. Uh, we've been mentioning hooks a lot, but I want to actually talk about hooks. Um, and we'll do a little bit more grab bag. Uh, so if there are other general topics that you have questions about that you feel like it, it wouldn't be a full... Um, a full episode or a full workshop, uh, then just throw that over in topic request. Um, yeah, so you can put things into topic request. We're excited to see more submissions. Yeah. And support, I want to get the name of the organization right. The organization is the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund. And again, the link to that is in the description. Yes, it's right there waiting for so it. So if you can, support their fundraiser. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Yay, we'll see you next time. Yeah, have a great week. Happy writing. Uh, and we'll all make it through. Hooray!